Good morning and welcome to King's Church Beverly. two boys Josiah and Jacob were little. We used to love going to the beach and building sandcastles. One particular day we'd built this huge fortification of sand. There were walls all the way around and they were big reinforced with stones and seaweed and I remember one of my little boys standing in the middle of this wall as the sea was coming in and he said to me, Dad, this castle is so strong, the sea will never be able to destroy it. And as I stood in the castle that day, waiting for the tide to come in, God really spoke strongly into my heart. And he said to me, all that the devil builds in this world is like a castle in the sand. It might look like a completely unassailable fortress that will stand against God and his people forever. But in fact, the tide of God's love and mercy will come in. And just like the sea, it'll wipe all traces of that fortress away. When we look at some of the strongholds that keep people away from the knowledge of God in our world today, they seem so big, so powerful. But I can promise you that the tides and the storms of history will come and go. And those strongholds which today imprison millions of people, keeping them from the love of God, 
will come crashing down just as the strongholds that the devil built in previous generations will come crashing down. God's purposes will prevail. His word and his plans are eternal. What he decrees always comes to pass. Today we're continuing our series in the book of Daniel and we're going to think about the story of Belshazzar's feast which is our Bible reading today. Many years passed and Daniel, now an older man, was still in service to the kingdom of Babylon when a new king, Belshazzar, came into power. King Belshazzar decided to host a great banquet for thousands of his leaders. During the feast, King Belshazzar had his servants bring out the gold and silver goblets that his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. As the king and his nobles drank from these sacred goblets, they praised false gods. Suddenly, a human hand appeared, and one finger began to write on the wall right in front of everyone at the feast. As King Belshazzar watched, he began to shake in fear. The king called for his wise men and said, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means, I will give them riches and power. But the wise men could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. This made the king even more terrified. Hearing the commotion, the queen came into the banquet hall and said, Don't be alarmed. There is a man who can help you. He was trusted by King Nebuchadnezzar because of his great insight and wisdom. So much so that Nebuchadnezzar put him in charge of all of Babylon's wise men. His name is Daniel, and if you bring him here, he will be able to tell you what this writing means. When Daniel appeared before King Belshazzar, the king told him, None of my wise men can read the writing on the wall and tell me what it means, but if you can, I will give you riches and honor beyond your wildest dreams. Daniel answered the king, You can keep your gifts and give them to someone else, but I will still read the writing for you and tell you what it means. Daniel told King Belshazzar, God gave your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, absolute power, glory, and splendor. Because of this, all the nations of the earth feared him. He did as he pleased to help or hurt anyone he chose. But Nebuchadnezzar became proud and arrogant, so God stripped him of his throne and his power. Only after this did King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledge that God alone is king over all the earth. But you, King Belshazzar, Daniel continued, have not humbled yourself, even though you knew all of this. Instead, you have become proud and honored yourself above God. When you brought out the goblets from God's temple, you drank from them and praised false gods who cannot see or hear or understand. In all of this, you did not honor God or his hand in your life. Because of this, God sent the hand and wrote the inscription. My king, Daniel said, this the inscription says, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. Mene means numbered. God has numbered your days and brought them to an end. Tekel means weighed. You have been weighed on the scales and you have been found wanting. Parson means divided. Your kingdom is divided and will be given to the Medes and Persians. Just as the king had promised, Daniel was dressed in wealth. That very night, King Belshazzar was killed and his kingdom was given over to another ruler. The Bible story ends mysteriously by saying that very night Belshazzar was killed and another ruler took his place. What most people don't know is how that happened. 
we actually know the exact date of Belshazzar's feast. It was October the 16th, 539 BC. What the Bible doesn't tell us, but that secular history does, is that for a few weeks before that feast, an enemy army had been camping outside the walls of Babylon, besieging the city. It was the army of the Persians, led by Cyrus the Mede. Now the Babylonians, they were worried by this foreign army camped outside their walls. Their city was the strongest city that the ancient world had ever seen. Babylon was surrounded by huge double walls with a 30-foot moat in the middle. The outer wall was 103 metres high, approximately the height of a 30-storey building. The wall itself was 29 metres wide, so wide that you could park eight chariots side by side on the top. In fact, you could turn a team of chariots and horses around on the top of the wall, they were so big. And there were a hundred gates, each were made of solid brass, so they were virtually indestructible. There were 250 watchtowers, which were 33 metres higher than the wall. And the walls were 90 kilometres long giving an area inside the walls of over 500 square kilometres. There was farmland inside the walls, enough to grow crops to feed the entire population of the city year after year. And the river Euphrates ran through the middle of the city so that people had a continuous, adequate supply of water. So the city was basically unassailable. It's a great picture of a stronghold that is undefeatable, like many of the strongholds we see that the devil has built in the world today. It looks like it will never fall. And Belshazzar wasn't worried at all about the armies of the Persians camped outside his walls. They could stay there forever or until they got bored and then they'd go away. It didn't bother him. And if as if to emphasise his defiance and to prove to everyone that he was undefeatable. On the 16th of October in the year 539 BC, this evil king Belshazzar held a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles while the army of Persia camped outside his gates. And while he was drinking wine, Belshazzar gave an order that the sacred cups that his father Nebuchadnezzar had captured from the temple in Jerus Jerusalem years before should be brought out of storage and used to give him and his guests um, something to drink from. Now this was a deliberate act of defiance, an insult against the God of Israel whom his father Nebuchadnezzar had come to worship in his later years. Now Belshazzar thought he was safe, but God had other plans. God himself had called this man Cyrus. He was the ruler of Persia and he was leading these armies camped outside of Babylon. In fact, the prophet Isaiah had prophesied 200 years ago about Cyrus by name. He said, in the future will come this man called Cyrus. I will take hold of him. God said, I will subdue nations before him. I will open shut doors. I will level all the mountains before him. He will come to know me and he will set my, free, my people free and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Now what actually happened is that God put a clever idea into the head of Cyrus. And as he was looking at these huge walls surrounding the city, 
He noticed that the river Euphrates flowed right through the walls into the city itself. And so he had the idea of diverting the river by secretly digging lots of canals and ditches out of sight. And when the moment came, he would give the command and open up all these canals so that the river would flow in a different direction. And so on the night of October the 16th, while Belshazzar and his nobles were watching that hand right on the wall, Cyrus and his men broke through the river banks and diverted the course of the water down all these canals. And Cyrus and his soldiers marched along the dry riverbed into the heart of the city and they captured the city of Babylon almost without a fight. And that very night Belshazzar was killed and the Emperor Cyrus took over the kingdom of Babylon. He appointed Darius the Mede to look after the kingdom and Darius appointed Daniel to be once again the Prime Minister. And in time Daniel would lead both Darius and even Cyrus himself to faith in the God of Israel. Cyrus was the emperor who gave the order to the Jews to return back home and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. So what can we learn from this amazing story? Well, just three short lessons. First of all, nothing can stand against the purposes of God. No fortress that the devil or any human being can construct is strong enough to keep God out. When God decrees something should happen, there is nothing that can stop it. Do you remember the story of the wise and the foolish builder? God's word and his purposes are the rock that we should build our life upon. Why the rock? Well, because God's word is eternal. Before the beginning of time, God made a plan. He decreed in his mind what was going to happen. And at the certain time in history, he decreed it with his word. And it came about. When you build on God's word, when you obey God's word, you're building on the rock because you're connecting to that plan of God that was decreed before the beginning of time. God's word is eternal. It goes back from before the beginning of time and it will stretch forward into eternity and nothing can stop it. But the devil, he builds on sand. Nothing that he does is eternal. One day he'll have an idea and he'll start constructing this fortress. It might become huge, it might become a worldwide religion or a habit, uh, an addiction that enslaves millions of people. But just like that idea began one day in the mind of the devil, it began in time and it will end in time as well. His plans don't last for eternity. Just like the tide comes up the beach and erases all traces of what happened on the beach that day, making the beach clean and new again, so the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases and his mercies are new every morning. God's love and his mercy will come and they'll wash away all those strongholds. And as I was on the beach that day with my two young boys, God said to me, that our prayer undermines the fortresses of the devil. The devil builds these great walls of his fortresses on permission that he is given by sinful people. It says in the book of Ephesians, do not give the devil a foothold. When people sin, that gives the devil a foothold in their life, in their home in their town and over town uh, over time the devil expands that foothold into a stronghold 
the foundation that that stronghold rests upon is the sin of those people. The wall might be big and it might be strong, but when we pray, we ask God to forgive that sin. And that undermines the very foundation that this huge fortress is standing upon. And as we continue to pray, that foundation disappears and that big strong wall can come tumbling down. Do you know, it doesn't take a huge wave to crash against the sandcastle to destroy it. It just takes little waves lapping at the bottom. Bit by bit, every wave that comes in takes a few grains of sand and the next wave takes a few more. And before long, that whole wall is standing on nothing. And so it comes down. As the tide turns, the waves become bigger and stronger and they can take away more. Now I want to tell you the story of how the Berlin Wall came crashing down. It was mainly through the prayer of God's people that that regime fell. Now it was especially hard to be a Christian in East Germany at that time. It was one of the most repressive regimes that the world had ever known. There was the ever-present fear of conflict with the West, which weighed heavily upon everyone. Germany was the front line between the nuclear powers of the West and the nuclear power of Russia. Everyone was afraid. And so the pastor of Leipzig's most dignified church, St. Stephen's, a man named Christian Führer, started a meeting every Monday night where people came together to pray for peace. At first there were less than a dozen people that would come together, huddled together in the cavernous Gothic cathedral where Johann Sebastian Bach had premiered some of his finest choral works. But the Christians had faithfully persevered and after seven years of prayer, there were now 8,000 people started coming into the church every Monday night to pray for peace. And other churches around the city had started to join in. And before long, the churches weren't big enough to house all the people that were praying for peaceful change. As the movement grew, people would gather in the streets and the squares outside, often 50, even 70,000 people gathering every Monday night, the largest demonstrations that East Germany had ever witnessed. With so many people expressing their dissatisfaction in prayer, the state was preparing for a violent response threatening to shut down the prayer rallies. But as the pastors started to lead their praying congregations out into the streets after the meeting, holding their candles, the authorities didn't know what to do. The police felt they couldn't fire on people who were walking in prayer, holding candles, shouting, no violence. And before long, the peace rallies, the prayer rallies, grew to over 120,000 people. The East German leader was forced to resign. Within a fortnight, there were 300,000 people meeting on a Monday night to pray. And within a month, the Berlin Wall, which seemed so uh, strong, so impenetrable, had come tumbling down. East German officials later said they were ready for anything except for candles and prayers. The strongholds that we're facing in our nation and in our world seem to be big and powerful 
and at the moment our prayers seem to be weak and small and shallow. But we need to do all that we can to increase the weight and the volume, the power of those prayers. Because I promise you, as we pray, we are undermining the strongholds of the devil's fortress. And as we keep eating away at those strongholds, eventually they will come tumbling down. God's word is eternal. His plans will prevail. And there's nothing that the devil can do to prevent it. God, we thank you that you are the Lord of our nation. And I just pray that you would work to overthrow all the fortresses that the devil has built. Knock down the walls that are keeping people away from the love of God. We pray for the love of money. Pray against those who are caught in that. Those who are caught in sexual immorality, in selfishness. Those whose minds are controlled by secular humanism. We just pray for our institutions of state and the media. Would you break through with the light of your word? And I just pray, Lord, that you would raise up in our day a mighty movement of intercession. Let the volume of prayer increase. Let the passion of prayer increase. Let the number of those praying increase. That the waves of prayer might be enough to sweep clean this land, to overthrow all that the devil has built and to usher in your beautiful kingdom. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's your
Senhor.